Ghana means business brought to you by Goyle. Goyle, good energy. Ghana means business. Your story, our message. 85. At this point, I guess NDM had realized that there was a significant chasm between where the PNDC was going yeah. and where the NDM stood. Yes. And there was this public um, statement made that the yeah. NDM no longer ideologically, politically identified Had itself with the, PNDC. with the PNDC. Yes. Subsequently, after 85, were certain key members of the, N, uh, of the NDM incarcerated for political reasons, and who were they? Yes, after that, by coming out to say that... After 85. A, a, April 85, mm -hmm. that we were no more uh, supportive of the PNDC. For the PNDC, it was a declaration of war. But wasn't that a dangerous thing to do? Knowing that it was a military regime and um, the excesses of the military and what they stood for. I mean, people had been killed for minor offenses. So your declaration of war uh, in a state that they controlled, uh, wasn't that a very dangerous decision and a very dangerous action that you guys undertook? Well, we knew that... You knew there were going to be repercussions. Oh, yeah, yeah. We knew that the PNDC was now going to do everything to cripple us, to including possibly eliminating people. Because not only did we know this, but the leaders of the PNDC, like Rawlings, explicitly, you know, said things. Like? Made statements. What, like what statements? Like, for instance, uh, much later on, at some point, uh, Rawlings declared that he should have shot us a million times over instead of putting us in prison. He even said this to a group of international journalists who had come here and so on. No, his hatred for us was not hidden. The thing about the NDM was that we tried as much as possible to do many things in the open. And also, perhaps, one of the things is that we never, in our meetings, in our public statements, or anywhere, subscribed to violence, or subscribed to anything amounting to trying to overthrow the government. We were not interested in that. So, even though we knew that PNDC was hostile and was going to be very hostile to us, we felt that, well, I mean, if we are not doing anything subversive, if we are not taking up arms, if we are not committing any crimes, and the PNDC chooses to do what it has, it wants to do, that is its business. It will have to respond to the public one way or another at some time or in the future. So um, in 1987, uh, May was the biggest wave of arrests of uh, members of the New Democratic Movement and other uh, uh, people from other organizations. You see, so who, the, who were arrested at this time? In 1987, May, uh, the people who were arrested included myself, Akutu Ampao, Edua Mankwa, Yao Graham, um, Ralph Kugwe. Ralph died last year, two years ago. Ralph Kugwe, five of us from the New Democratic Movement. And then Kwesi Pratt from the Kwame Nkrumah Revolutionary Guards and John Ndebugre also from the Kwame Nkrumah 
Revolutionary Guards, and two others. I've forgotten the names. So there were nine altogether who were arrested the same day and put in detentions in different prisons around the country. And was, what was your crime? Uh, under the PNDC, you did not have to commit a crime hmm. to be arrested and detained. And indeed, for us, in the New Democratic Movement, we felt that we were lucky to be arrested. Uh, some of us felt that perhaps there is somebody in there who made this wisdom to prevail that put them in detention. Otherwise, we thought there were elements in there who would have rather shot us. Mm. But in 1987 also, mm. the killings of people under the PNDC had subsided. You see, the, they had now got the Western backing through the monies they got from the IMF. Remember that by 1987, the Western media were touting Rawlings as uh, a genius in uh, managing an economy in Africa. He was touted as uh, one of the up-and-coming great leaders of Africa. And so I suspect that um, Mkwesi Boche was seen as the, you know... the, so the structural adjustment Yes, program. because of the structural adjustment and how assiduously and diligently and obediently the PNDC was managing it to the letter, they were the, the idol of the West of the IMF, the World Bank, and so on. So I, I suspect that they felt that they didn't want to blow it by killing us. Because I'm, I'm, we were all certain that there were elements within the PNDC who would have rather had us dead. Mm. But I think the circumstances wasn't a good time to be killing people who hadn't committed any crime, who hadn't conspired to overthrow you, and so on. But what one can say is that, at the time, the New Democratic Movement was preparing to come out with a statement, not only a statement, a program of calling for a return to democratic rule. We were preparing this document, as what we call a strategic objective, and we were going to launch it publicly in May. And of course, we knew that, we, as I said, because we were not conspiring to overthrow a government, we were not too concerned about doing things in such secrecy as not to be, we didn't care if anybody leaked anything to the PNDC because we knew there were people within the, PN, the, the NDM mm -hmm who still were not too sure whether our opposition to the uh, PNDC was good or was not good. So we knew there were people who mm -hmm. would be sending information to Rawlings yes. and other members of the PNDC, but we didn't care because we didn't think we were conspiring to commit any violent crimes or to subvert the government. In any case, who were we to overthrow any government? much more the PNDC. Ghana means business. Your story, our message. Every now and again, Goyle makes good things happen. This time, Goyle has introduced Super XP Run 95, a higher grade fuel loaded with additives and yet sold at the same price as normal fuel. Go Super XP Run 95 enhances engine performance like never before. It maintains the engine by keeping it clean from carbon deposits. Go Super XP Run 95 is designed to burn slowly and thus improves fuel economy, making you save money after several kilometers. Go Super XP Run 95 gives you a smooth driving experience that is less vibrations. Fill up with Go Super XP Run 95. Now there's no need to pay more for any higher grade fuel. Goil has that sorted. Goil, good energy. Ghana means business. Your story, our message. But that was almost 
35 years ago, and I'm sure you were much younger, and there were certain youthful exuberances within you that also defied the concern for personal self. So I think the ideology at that time was very strong. Well, uh, I'm, but I, I, I must say that we were not reckless. Mm. You see, it's just that we believed in the right justness of what we were doing. We also did not believe in violence. We felt that it's important to do things transparently by consensus, by discussion, rather than by attempting to engage in violence. And we knew what we were dealing with, that in fact, the best pretext for us to be eliminated physically would be anything that resembled a conspiracy to try and use violence and so on. Um, we knew and we, we, we analyzed correctly that, like all military regimes, it will come to an end. And if anything happened to us, um, they would have to answer when civilian government came. So let's How long were you detained? Uh, I was in, 87. in detention for 19 months. 19 months? Yeah. I go to Ampau. I came out in November 1988. Oh no, December 1988. 28 December, three days after Christmas. Um, no, no, hold on, Prof. You were detained for 19 months. Yes. Where were you detained? Koforidua Prison and Ashafort Prison. Those were the, well, the BNI cells. BNI cells for perhaps one month. Yeah, and then Koforidua and Asha Fort prison. What was the experience like? <laughs> the experience of prison. Well, prison is, what do I say the experience? You are deprived of your, your, your right to movement, your right to do the things you normally would do. You are thrown into, uh, the Kofordia prison, for instance, was very, very congested. A cell that was constructed to take in about eight people now accommodated sometimes 36 people, sometimes 50 people. So at night, uh, there was nothing like sleeping. There, you can't sleep when a room of, that was built for eight people now accommodates 36 people. You just have to, you can't even squat properly. But uh, what the prison authorities did was that they devoted one room for us political detainees. And so there were eight, at most 12 of us, in that same size of room. So you can say that, uh, you know, they, they, they knew that the prison authorities under that military regime told themselves that these people are not covered by the law because every prisoner, every convict, there is a paper, an order from the courts, but that these people are not covered by any, any, any legal document. And so they were careful. Again, they had all seen military regimes can come and go. So some of them, the officers told us that we know one day we may have to answer. So we have to take good care of you. So uh, they would give you some preferential treatment so that you don't suffer something that, because as they used to tell us, when the day comes for us to answer, the PNDC will not be there to protect you. We will answer. So they give strict instructions to uh, the prison officers. I mean, the Kufurdua prison, I don't know about how the to be very careful how they treated us. And, and so the prison experience is a nasty one. It's not a good one. That's why it's called a prison, and that's why it is built for bad people that society needs to keep away. But one thing about prison is that prison is not a place that will make you change your mind. No, in, in, in fact, 
it makes you stronger in what you believe in. You, you, be, you become, you, you feel more uh, justified. You know, so prison, bad as it is, it's not a deterrent for a person put in there because of what they believe in. And so um, in my case, I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of reading. I had friends all over the world, in America and elsewhere, who were bringing me books. So I used to read a lot. The only difficulty was that you didn't have a table to write on, and that was very difficult in Koforidua. In Koforidua. But I got a prisoner to make a table for me, <laughs> a prisoner who was a carpenter. So I wrote a lot of book reviews. I've never written as many book reviews as I did in Koforidua prison. The Asha Fort prison was, the cell was more comfortable, a bit more spacious, but the prison superintendent was a very hostile, um, very, very hostile to political detainees. His name is Baba, um, prison superintendent Baba. He was a very a brute because he took away all books, pencils, paper, everything from, from, from the prisoners. He was a bad man, I must say. I don't, I, I don't think you, you need people like that to be in the... But I think he was doing that because he was personally supportive of the PNDC. So he thought it was an opportunity to ensure that we feel bad, you know, uh, having been brought there by the PNDC. But otherwise, uh, prison under the PNDC was very a common place for all kinds of people the PNDC didn't like. All kinds of people, not only people they didn't like for political reasons. There were so many people in prison who were there, they didn't know why they'd been brought there. Very sad. The ARBFS Bank, we told ourselves that we should be the most effective and the most efficient service provider to the rural community. We need to serve the rural and community banks to be able to serve their customers. ARB Apex Bank, with a network of 144 rural and community banks, RCBs, make up the largest network of banks in Ghana. We are everywhere, and so the preferred choice. Visit an RCB in your community. ARB Apex Bank, together for progress. Ghana means business. Your story, our message. Prof, the media over the past few years is undergoing something. I can't exactly say what, but what I can do is share some examples of what has been going. The murder of Ameswale, very, very sad, and to this day, there hasn't been an arrest or a conviction. The closing down of Radio Gold and Radio XYZ, and numerous attacks on journalists on the one hand. On the other hand is the media and how they are conducting themselves. You listen to a radio station or a TV station or read something in print media and immediately you know which political party they are serving. What is happening to journalism, the landscape of media, the control of media by the National Communications Authority and the media itself in terms of how journalists conduct themselves. What has happened? Because earlier you mentioned somebody like Cameron Dojo. It looks like people like him, Elizabeth Tohine, and others who espouse a certain position, including your good self, have almost become extinct. What is happening, Prof? Well, you see, <laughs> in my estimation, uh, we say that in Chi, Abeba Akuna Esai Nsa. In other words, what is bad almost always is louder 
than what is good. Why am I saying this? I'm saying this because in my estimation, there is also a lot of very good journalism going on in this country. There are a number of radio stations who are very professional, who are doing such wonderful work. I can mention our old GBC is very, very good. City FM is excellent in terms of their news coverage, the kind of objectivity they bring to issues, the kind of independence in terms of editorial judgment they bring. The same with Joy FM. Um, Peace FM is also a very good station in my estimation. It is not partisan. Um, then when you leave Accra and you go to Kumasi, you go to Takradi, you go to Takwa, you go to all the regional capitals and even the district areas, you find radio stations who are doing very, very good journalism. Uh, what we call community radio stations, these are small stations in rural areas who are serving their communities very well without being partisan, without being sectarian, and without being um, blind to uh, the ethics and etiquettes of uh, communication. Now, it is those media directly owned by major leaders, principal leaders of political parties, particularly NDC and MPP, who are guilty of the problems that everybody is observing and therefore uh, tarnishing the image of journalism or, or broadcasting in this country. Our good old graphic of which board I'm the chairman, I think is also a very, very high quality newspaper who try to be as objective, professional, fair-minded and level-headed as any you can get anywhere. Um, but apart from all of that, there are a number of issues with our media. The partisan issue you are talking about is one thing, and that becomes even more pronounced during this period of electioneering campaigning. And what is even worse, about them is the insults, the abuse. I mean, what does tell me, what that kind of behavior tells me is that those people, those political leaders of those political parties who own those radio stations and hire young people to go out there and use the microphone to unwarrantedly tarnish the image of persons who have worked hard to earn personal refu reputation, what that tells me is that those political leaders who own those radio stations do not respect our cultural ethics and etiquettes about public communication. What do I mean? I mean, we all come from Ghana. Whether we are in Accra or in a Wisa, my village, my town, if you stand up to speak in the public, you are mindful of some etiquette. Absolutely. And so if you invest in a radio station and you employ, build a house for, buy a car for somebody, to come on the microphone to hell abuses at John Ejikum Kufo, to hell insults at Jerry John Rollins, to hell insults, attack and impugn the character of Ekufuado or John Mahama, 
just because of politics. I think that the owner is somebody who deserves no respect as a Ghanaian in any of our cultures. But you of, see, because... On that level, then what kind of reforms, structural changes, do we need to make in terms of our regulations? Because at the end of the day, in the absence of robust regulations yeah. or reforms, yeah. this very incisive, poignant, and instructive recommendations that you're making, they will not go anywhere. They won't go away. They so go what away. do we need to do in terms of the media? First of all, I think that the public, the electorate, who also listen to these radio stations and so on, should put pressure on the political parties. I'm not, I won't go to the National Media Commission or NCA, but the political parties, the people who want to come and rule us. Why are you investing in a radio station that will not tell us about why you want to become a, a, a president or a minister, but okay. rather use it to attack me? I mean, if you broadcast what I'm saying now, and you were to monitor some of these things, you'll see that they will be attacking me, <laughs> proving what I'm saying is right. Is so I, I think that the pressure should be put on the political parties to discipline their leaders who own these radio stations, to get them to stop. But unfortunately, our political parties are also not about certain cultural uh, uh, refinements. So, For them, once they win power, that's all. They are not interested in... Especially if they are yeah. the financiers of the party. Besides, even those who are not the financiers, they dare not t touch the people who own the radio stations because the people who own the radio stations are the biggest financiers of the parties, and so they are untouchable. It comes back to our political parties in the Fourth Republic having generally acquired the culture of not criticizing anything their members do, right or wrong. Their members are committing all manner of atrocities, but you will not hear a political leader, even a presidential candidate, reprimanding any of those activities. So. Uh, we cannot expect the National Media Commission or the... Because, you see, if the National Media Commission attempts to discipline these uh, agencies of media, nothing will change. Because once they are in power, they will use their power to do whatever they want. Um... I'm sure the executive director and the board of directors of most of these institutions who are appointed by yes, the same party. Not power. the National Media Commission. The National Media Commission is quite independent. But its mandate does not call for certain measures. Because, um, so again... That, so we need reforms in there to ensure we address these peculiar problems. It depends on the kind of regulation we are talking about. Folks, this was nothing short of incredible. Stay tuned, same time, for part three and the concluding episode of our evening with the illustrious and immeasurable Professor Kwame Kakari.